Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, uh, whenever you might be listening to this. My name is Karen Eifler, and I serve as the director of Collegium, a national colloquy on faith and intellectual life. And we're launching a new feature on the collegium.org website, book talks about books that matter. And our very first guest is Jessica Koblenz, an associate professor of theology at St. Mary's College in uh, South Bend, Indiana, and she is going to be talking with us today about her um, most recent and multiple prize-winning book, Dust in the Blood, um, A Theology of Life with Depression, which was published in 2022 to great acclaim by Liturgical Press. And uh, I told Jessica that I'd really like this to be a conversation and not not so much a review of her book. But I will tell you that um, if you choose, if you uh, click on the link that was in the announcement of this talk, it'll take you directly to that talk and, and you'll be really, really happy um, that you that it's part of your your library. So Jessica, welcome. And um, I want to start just with the title, which is really provocative. I love that title. And there's a little story behind it, a promise that you made yourself on a drive on a, on a dark and stormy night. Could you tell us a little bit about that and maybe offer a little bit more uh, from Robert Lowell's poem that yielded the phrase dust in the blood? Happy to start there, Karen. And, and thanks for having me. Um Coincidentally, I first encountered this phrase, dust in the blood, while living at one of the host institutions of Collegium, St. John's University in Collegeville. I was really fortunate to be at the Collegeville Institute there where I was writing my dissertation. And one day after, you know, just recently submitting my dissertation, which um, is was a little different from what this book has turned out to be, but was also on the topic of depression. I was driving down the highway in central Minnesota, um, kind of bracing myself for for black ice and trying to pass the time by listening to an interview that Terry Gross of Fresh Air was um, was doing with Kay Redfield Jameson, who is herself um, a very well-known depression memoirist, but also uh, a scholar of depression who has written a lot of books. Um, and that day she was talking about a biography of Robert Lowell, um, the poet that had just been published. And um, in the course of the interview, Terry Gross brought up uh, a few lines that Jameson had highlighted in her book, um, and it was actually not from a poem of Robert Lowell's, but an interview that he had done where he uh, was asked about his uh, life with bipolar depression. And he described his manic episodes as fire in the blood and his depressive episodes as dust in the blood. Mm -hmm. And I was just you know, stunned by this phrase um, for a number of reasons. As, and as I recount in the conclusion of the book, you know, it was one of those phrases where like, it just stopped me in my tracks and I had to resist almost literally pulling over to the side of the road to process what I had heard. One of the reasons it resonated so much with me was because I felt that it captured something about my own experience of depression, about the experiences of depression that I had sort of immersed myself in from the beginning of my research on depression through memoirs and, and interviews and things like that. Um, to me, it captured that depression is, for many of us, a really encompassing experience. Um, and this idea of, of depression as dust in the blood, I thought, captured that in the same way that our blood kind of touches every uh every inch of our bodies, my experience of depression and so many people's was like that. Um, and then also this earthy imagery of dust really resonated with what would become a really central image in the book, Dust in, a Blood, uh, Dust in the Blood, which is um, this image of the wilderness that uh, I pick up on both in people's descriptions of their own depression as a sort of harsh desolate place where they find themselves, and also um, the, the Christian tradition's long treatment of stories of displacement into the wilderness, which begin in the Hebrew scriptures, the Christian New Testament, and have um, been picked up on all throughout uh, Christian theology and the Christian tradition. Mm 
Okay, well, there are many evocative phrases uh, that we'll be circling back to to give people a real sense of that book. But I, I just, I loved the story that you promised yourself if you ever wrote a book about it, that would be the title. And hooray that that happened. <laughs> Non-theologians listening, and that I would imagine would be most of Collegium alums, could you explain the difference between the task you set for yourself um, in terms of developing a theology of depression and how that is different, maybe how it's similar to um, just making sense of depression or finding meaning in depression. What what does it mean to develop a theology of depression? I was interested in drawing on some of the distinctive sources that that theologians in particular and Christians more broadly draw on to sometimes make meaning of realities in the world, but also just to to interpret and 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 frame and think more broadly about a whole range of human realities, um, including depression. And so those distinct sources include scripture, the Holy Bible uh, for Christians, as well as the beliefs and practices of the Christian tradition that that um, have been passed on for generations since the beginning of of Christianity. And so as a theologian, you know, it's a very sort of interdisciplinary discipline itself. Um, I draw on psychology. I draw on a lot of philosophy. I draw on a lot of narrative, um, as I already mentioned, to help me think about depression in this book. But what's a little different about it being a theology is that I'm also drawing on what I and other Christians deem to be so the truths of scripture and the truths of these um, beliefs and practices that have been passed on. And um, in in the case of theology, and, and particularly with depression, it's not as simple as like sort of saying, oh, I want to I want to do a theology of depression. I'll just find what Christians have been talking about for generations on this topic. Like a lot of things in our world, depression is not something that has always existed. It's not something that people in the ancient worlds were necessarily talking about in the way that we talk about it. Um, and so it takes a little creativity often to bring these Christian sources to bear on a topic that we're still learning so much about. Um, and that that requires some some creativity, as I said, I think that's part of what makes theology interesting and exciting. Okay. Um, you, this, this is a very consciously Christian book and you spend, uh, some significant time talking about the two main approaches that, uh, Christians, whether they're practicing Christians or theologians, or maybe even clergy, um, people in the pews, there are two kind of broad responses that, that Christians have historically had to depression and, um, you're pretty critical of them in in the sense that they're not very life giving, um, which which I think we need to hear a little bit more about. So could you spend a little time uh, unpacking a couple the the two main uh, responses to depression in the Christian tradition? Sure. So I I offer my own theology of depression against a back a backdrop of these two main ways that Christians talk about depression, at least based on what social scientists are telling us. Um, and this is these are all sort of accessible online with a, a Google or two. You can find lots of examples of this yourselves. Um, the first is what I call depression as a self-imposed moral evil. And that's a sort of jargony way of, of categorizing a myriad of theologies um, in which Christians are either asserting that depression is itself sinful, that it's bad, that it's against the will of God, or that depression is something that God imposes on a person because they've been sinful in some other way. So maybe they did something bad and their punishment is that they're depressed. Um, while you're right, Karen, that a lot of people don't find these um, this particular type of theology of depression life-giving, it's really important to me to acknowledge that this view is really popular because a lot of people do find it life-giving. 
And I think it's important for us to understand why, at least that's been important to me in thinking theologically about depression. There is a sort of logic that underpins this theological view that people find reassuring sometimes. It, uh, it, it comforts some people because attributing depression to their own sinfulness can lead to the conclusion that if they only repent from sin, um, if they only try harder to be a better, more faithful person, that their depression will go away, which for people in the midst of this really difficult condition sometimes find you know, hopeful. Um, it can give people a sense of agency amid a condition that often is characterized by, by diminished agency. At the same time, um, it's often immediately apparent to onlookers that this also tends to blame people for their own depression. <laughs> and that's something that can be really, really difficult for people to take when there's already this experience of sort of self-loathing and blame that many people experience um, with depression. On the other hand, and, and actually much more common in Catholic circles in particular, is a view of depression as what I call divine instruction. It is a way that God teaches people something for their own good. And so this is often expressed in sort of sayings like, this is just a cross that a person needs to bear, or, um, you know, there's a silver lining to this. Um, this is a dark night, but once you're through it, you're going to see that God has made you stronger, more faithful. Um, and again, some people find this to be a really comforting view of depression. Um, it gives them a sense that God is involved in what's going on, that somehow, while it doesn't make sense to them, there is some underlying reason um, that God is doing this. Um, at the same time, many people also find this to perpetuate a sort of sadist view of God, a God who teaches people things by punishing them um, with something as difficult as depression. Um, it also doesn't account for the fact that not everybody who experiences depression does survive it. Um, there is no kind of bright side or light at the end of the tunnel um, in this life for, for those folks, and that doesn't really account for that. Um, so I saw a need um, for, for other ways of talking about depression that I think sort of built on the, the appealing things that are embedded in, in these really popular theologies um, and this, this general desire that some people have to think about their depression in relation to their faith lives. Um, but I wanted to find ways of doing that that maybe sidestep some of these pitfalls that a lot of people say aren't helpful to them. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a vote of confidence. I think that you, that you made a lot of strides toward that goal. Um, you also provide really um, thoughtful commentary on the public at large. And one thing that really surprised me, uh, chapter three, you asserted that in recent decades, stigma around mental health has actually increased. And uh, at an intuitive level, that really surprised me because it feels like we're talking so much more honestly and transparency and, and transparently about the reality of um, all kinds of mental illness. And we have high profile celebrities and sports figures and Ted Lasso famously um, took on the need to um, to normalize and de-stigmatize de mental, uh, mental illness, including depression. And so could you talk a little bit about why that might be the case that despite um, very avid efforts on so many fronts, the, the stigma has actually increased. Yeah, this is something that really startled me when I started learning more about mental health stigma. And in this part of the book in particular, I cite a few studies that are tracking particularly how Americans over the years have um, associated mental illness, people with mental illness, with danger in particular. And what they found is that from, you know, 1956 up into 
the 21st century where many people expected people to be um, less likely to associate mental illness with danger, it actually increased significantly, like in the ballpark of doubling. Um, and and so what at least some of the scholars of, of mental health stigma that I've been reading observed is that it's not enough just to be talking more about mental illness. It's not enough just to be acknowledging its reality more often. The way we educate people about it, the way we talk about it really, really matters. And I'm sure we can all think of recent examples of when there was something like a horrific mass shooting. And one of the first things that news people, reporters go to are, you know, people are asking questions about the mental state of this person. And that can often reinscribe these associations between mental illness and really violent behavior, where in reality, um, a, a lot of studies say that people with mental illness are actually less likely to be violent people and certainly less likely to be violent to, to others. Um, and, and, and so a lot of the way that we talk about mental illness and mental health, um, you know, while more frequent doesn't actually get at these underlying views um, that people still have. And actually, one of the really fascinating things that I've heard with regard to these like kind of celebrity mental health campaigns is that in a counterintuitive way, um, these also can, I think, at best be ineffective, if I'm understanding the research correctly, but sometimes even harmful. I'm thinking here of the work of, of Patrick Corrigan, and in particular, he's a psychologist of mental health stigma, and he's pointed out that that oftentimes because these celebrities are held in such high esteem, they're seen as such exceptional people, people don't actually think like, oh, they live well with depression, therefore I can live well with depression. It's easy to dismiss these celebrities as being the exception mm -hmm. to the norm, which is, you know, that the rest of us might might be fated to live a much less successful and acclaimed life if we have one of these mental illnesses. Um, and, and we're still some people might say, oh, you know, this person can do all these wonderful things. Like, look at me. I'm nothing. Something must be wrong with me if I have the same condition and yet I can't perform. So it, it's just an illustration of the, the fact that it's really, really complicated. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that that I've taken from some of this literature is the importance of ordinary people, like most of us, you know, uh, ordinary people who are living with these conditions to um, to talk about them openly if they're in a position to do so, um, so that people start to see that, you know, ordinary people all around us are actually um, living well, um, very often with these conditions. Um, and, and we need to emphasize the fact that while we should not underestimate how difficult these conditions are, and I really tried to do that in this book to speak honestly about how exceptionally difficult depression is, it's also important that we talk about the fact that it can be treated. Um, that people can learn to live well and do live well, even with these really, really difficult conditions. So there's a lot of a lot of work still to be done. Yeah. Um, you are quite eloquent about the being attentive to the kinds of language that we use, and but you're equally eloquent about the need to be silent, to be listened, uh, to be good listeners, and um, but you also distinguish between a fruitful kind of listening or silence and one, a silence that just reinforces the status quo. And um, could you tell us what you mean by those two thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as a, as a theologian, particularly a theologian who is trained in feminist theology, in a lot of political and liberationist theologies that are very concerned with 
with suffering and also how Christianity has contributed to a lot of people's suffering. Um, I'm very sensitive to the fact that there's there's just a long history of Christians in general and Christian theologians like me doing more harm than good when they speak up about suffering, especially the suffering of other people. And there is a way that that could chasten us to the point of silence. <laughs> and I, I talk about that possibility um, in, in the book that um, so often theologians are are sort of trained, we're habituated to impose meaning onto other people's suffering, to tell other people what, what God is doing in their lives or what God is not doing in their lives and how they ought to relate to their own suffering. And um, thankfully, there's been a lot of, of internal critiques of that kind of theological imposition that have arisen, um, particularly you know, in the last 60, 70 years. Um, however, um, I also think that just being silent about these issues is not a responsible disposition either, particularly because as, as, as we were just talking about, people are hearing claims about God in their everyday lives all the time. They're hearing them from religious teachers, peers, they're getting them on the internet, they're getting them in books and all these things. And, and um, I think theologians have a responsibility to use the privilege of our training and our profession to invest in generating more ideas about God and about suffering that people can use um, in their lives to help them live in the way that I think God wants us to live. Um, and so I, I, on one hand, say like, it's not responsible for us to just not talk about things because we're afraid of, of messing them up as Christian theologians have so often done. At the same time, I, I call I call us to a sort of theological restraint um, that we actually have to listen very carefully um, to what other people are saying about their own suffering. We have to be careful not to impose meaning onto other people's suffering. I think there's a key difference um, between accompanying people as they try and make meaning of their own suffering and imposing our own ideas onto other people. And um, I, I think a lot in the book with, with theologian Karen Kilby about this, whose work really helped me think through it, but also really challenged me as a theologian who, um, as I said, is kind of habituated to tell people when they're right and wrong about a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you uh, go into some depth on the work of Karen Kilby and her uh, talking about first, second, and third person. I, I don't know if we have time to do justice to all of those, but is there a sort of tweet formerly, or X formerly known as a uh, tweet version of really key takeaways um, from Karen Kilby's work that, that we, that would give us a sense of her impact on your thinking? Yeah, I think this idea of, of theological restraint in general, um, has been my takeaway, but, but another way to put this concisely is, you know, she really emphasizes that there's a difference between talking about my suffering, that's the first person, versus our suffering or your suffering, um, which is the second person and third person. And the second that we shift gears from first person to second and third person, we're in this danger zone of really risking the imposition um, of meaning onto others. Um, and, and just the last thing I'll say about that is that I think is important is Kilby's not just motivated by sort of pastoral or interpersonal tact. She does it, she's not just trying to get theologians to be nice, like stop imposing meaning on other people. You should be a nice person. A lot of this is motivated by her own attention to the limits of our understanding. And I think there is something 
there are just deep things we do not understand about God's relationship to suffering, about why a good God would allow this to suffering. And instead of trying to explain that or impose our ideas about it to other people, she thinks like maybe we just need to admit when we don't know what God is doing in another person's life. And I think that's a wise intellectual thinking. Yeah. Um, facile solutions, as attractive as it might be. I mean, especially those of us in higher ed, we're not used to, and we really don't like admitting the limits of what we know and don't know. But this gives me a really good segue into uh, another direction I wanted to move our conversation, which was um, so many of our collegium alums, if not all of them, are they live in the world of suffering and we we are accompaniers to colleagues to students and maybe ourselves um, suffering from depression or other mental illnesses and you evoked um, you you use Rowan Williams evocative phrase tragic imagination and that struck me as as a helpful framing for those of us who who want to be thoughtful um, listening humble non facile accompaniers. And tell us a little bit about your understanding of that idea of tragic imagination. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love this from him too. Um, he is contrasting this idea of the tragic imagination to um, not only a sort of comedic imagination um, from the ancient world um, mm -hmm. and ancient dramas, but also our own sort of modern Western tendencies to um, to try and understand, explain, and resolve any sort of, in this case, suffering that we see, any sort of problem, um, right? In the classic um comedic dramas of the ancient world, right? There was a, you know, innocent beginning, a problem presents itself, and then it's sort of resolved at the end. We have this happy ending, a very tidy um, but entertaining storyline. With, with these tragedies, right, the world appears much more complicated. People's best intentions don't play out, right? Um, there's you know, great people who are um, befallen with suffering and tragedy for no apparent reason. There's often not a very happy ending, right? People don't get what they deserve. There's a sort of nonsensicalness that's presented in these ancient tra tragedies. And what Rowan Williams picks up on is the fact that, you know, while, while many of us today um, encounter these ancient stories in books, right? These kind of solitary encounters in, in our libraries or um, dorm rooms or what have you. Um, he really emphasizes that these were plays that were performed publicly in a community by a community because, he argues, there was a value on confronting communities with these kinds of nonsensical realities. Um, and he said the result is that that communities learn to sit with um, the inexplicable, the uncontainable suffering of life um, in a way that could have ethical effect on them. And mm -hmm. so what he argues for Christians today is that we would be well to have more of this tragic imagination. We would be able to interpret um, our own Christian stories um, that have this sort of tragic quality to them in a way that is honest about that. Um, and that that would actually, again, have an ethical effect on us, that it would um, in particular position us to stop asking you know, how can I explain this? How can I fix this? Sometimes that's a very important thing to, to ask. But in, in the face of um, of suffering where those questions don't get you very far, how can I explain this? How can I fix this? Learning to, to have this tragic imagination where we can sit with inexplicable suffering can orient us towards a different kind of question. So instead of how can I fix this, maybe how can we as a community bear the mm -hmm. inexplicable together? 
if I can't explain why this is happening, how can we create a world that already has structures to support um, people when the inexplicable does happen? And I think I think of depression in many ways as one of these inexplicable, um, nonsensical conditions, right? Um, thankfully, we have a lot of scientists and medical professionals who are working hard to do what they can to understand it and mitigate it. But it's a condition that still has no cure, even though it's it's treatable. And it's certainly theologically, we don't have an explanation for why something like this exists. And so I think being able to um, to ask these other questions that the tragic imagina- imagination elicits about like, how can we become a community that that can hold inexplicable things without that we that we can't fix, I think is really important. And that seems even so much bigger than the specific problem of depression or mental illness. I mean, there there's a lot of there's a lot of suffering in this in this life, right? Mm-hmm. And I think with, probably without intending to, a lot of what you wrote gives us some tools to to sit with, to think with. Um, and one of the things I really want readers, uh, listeners to know, and readers when they get a chance to take a look at your book, I love that. This book is meticulously footnoted in research, and yet your voice really comes through in a powerful, not self-serving way. And um, as a nod to that, what I'm hoping you would be willing to do to close out this conversation, Jessica, is to read the last paragraph um, from your book, which I found really moving and just a way to encapsulate uh, one of the things that entranced me um, by your book, Dust in the Blood. Thanks. Happy to. Um, Just for some context here, um, in the previous paragraph, I'm I'm calling Christians to um, to work to become people who don't make a really difficult condition like depression worse, (laughs) um, and and to do what they can to be more hospitable and supportive of people with depression. This book is one contribution to this effort a small but long-labored offering of support to depression sufferers who, like me, are trying to live in and through this difficult wilderness before God and with the community of faith that has sustained an animated life. To those of us who accompany depression sufferers in this, let us do our best to become the community that sufferers need for survival and improved quality of life both through our actions and through the theologies that we surround them with. Like our God, may we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a generous, loving presence, one that can bear with the harrowing wildernesses that so many of us live within and through. And let us do so in loving memory of those who have died in the desolate landscape of depression, with hope that they rise in another world where all the possibilities that make up the very best of living are in abundance, always. Thank you, Jessica Copeland, author of Dust in the Blood, A Theology of Life with Depression, published by Liturgical Press. You can reach both Jessica and and her book in the notes that accompanied uh, the the link to this podcast. If you... Um, If you have a book or you know of a book that is recently out that would be of interest to Collegium alums, please let me know at Eifler, um, Eifler at collegium.org. Again, that that contact information is in our in our header. Jessica Copeland, so good to spend some time with you. And I look forward. I know that more good things are coming um, from your capacious mind and heart. And I look forward to talking with you again. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Karen.